like to take a few moments and explain some of the whys and wherefores of not only what we believe in our assembly, but also what we practice and, and why. I think everything we do is scriptural and reasonable, and it's good for us to consider them together at times. This morning we want to do that possibly more than uh, preaching to you this morning, I just want to speak to you heart to heart talk some of the things that are upon my heart uh, as a pastor to the, to the church this morning. Job 37, verse 16. Verse 16 of Job 37. Speaking on the thought this morning, strike a balance. Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? Dost thou know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we ask for thy direction as we consider the things of the Lord together in the next few moments. We're glad for the privilege to gather our Sunday school together in such a way as we had this morning for the inspiration given to the young church and received from them. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou shalt make our valley next Sunday a great one to thy glory to the salvation of our lost. And as we gather to the thanks, well, be with thy anointing and thy blessing to accomplish your work that should last for eternity. Remain in the service this morning. We ask that you'll give us guidance and direction. Help each one of us to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Give us a desire to be what you would have us to be. That we might be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We well, thank you for thy blessings upon us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> this one scripture draws to our attention the knowledge of God. And that he is a God of balance. Our God is a God of balance. It is shown in the clouds, the scripture draws out here. You see the wondrous work of God. How perfect he is in knowledge. And how he has a balance in all that he does through the relationship of the clouds and the sky to the, to the earth. And how he causes the rain to fall just at the right time. And then he calls us the... Uh, water to ascend in the heavens and uh, circle again and again the water from the clouds 
body, and yet I fail to realize the responsibilities and the obligations that are upon us. Being a part of the body and working together in balance, we have to avoid anything that would divide, anything that would hinder, anything that would disrupt the unity of the whole. Now this is the reason that we have united prayer meetings. This is the reason we keep the prayer room open practically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, give an opportunity for people to come and pray. We call Wednesday morning to Saturday night prayer meeting, prayer before service and after service. We, we, have, we have prayer meetings that are open to everybody in the church. Everyone is open. We invite everyone, we announce to everyone, and we have prayer meetings that can be united prayer meetings for everyone in the church. But if anyone starts a private prayer meeting in their own home or in some other place and starts inviting people from the church to go to those prayer meetings, they do more damage and more harm to the church of Jesus Christ than they ever will do good. Simply because it is a means of bringing division lack of unity, and therefore it harms and hurts. It is better that we have a prayer meetings or services where the entire body is invited to come, and anyone and everyone can come and join in those services. Will you say amen? Now, we've learned this a long time ago, and this is, this is so important that whatever we do, we do together. Uh, just a short time ago, I learned one, in one state that there have been seven churches that have been split wide open and the cause of them were prayer meetings. Someone started a prayer meeting on the sideline and caught his prayer meeting, and at least it was supposed to be a prayer meeting, end up uh, at a gossiping session and end up splitting the church. The seven churches this last year split uh, in one state because of so called uh, prayer meetings. That's why we've always said if anyone starts a prayer meeting and starts inviting people from our church to go to that prayer meeting, they cannot be a member of this church. Because they are doing more to hurt and harm and divide the church than they are good. We want prayer meetings, we want people to gather together, but we want them to do it unitedly uh, in the, under, the, uh, under the direction of the, of the church, and then we can all move together as one force. Now, I know uh, on the other side there are some churches who have built their church, built their group together uh, purely on a social basis. They don't have any prayer meetings, they don't have, they don't have to worry about having private prayer meetings, they don't even have public prayer meetings. But their entire church has been built and maintained on social. They are more, I feel, they are more a society than they are a church. Now many of you have probably come out of churches just like that, even as I have. We know what it is on that side of the fence, and they're way out of balance. They're off on a sideline, something possibly that began to be just a sideline for them, end up to be the main line of their entire church. They're social, and they're gathering together to eat and, and, and to have fun and to play games. is more important to them than their church and their church service. They have bigger crowds at their chicken dinners than they do at their Sunday morning service. Because they have built their church. On the thoughts of socializing and eating and fun and making merriment. And I think that they are fulfilling that scripture that says in these last days that uh, they'll be eating, drinking, and marrying and giving and marrying and just having a big time. Just eating, drinking in the, in, in the church, in the church is a sponsor, this, this sort of thing. And so there are many people who will never go visiting, they'll never make an effort to win souls. They'll never attend a prayer meeting. Uh, it, it's hard for them even to attend a Thursday night service. Uh, uh, they'll never do anything in that way, and yet they love to go to parties and sports events. They'll, they, they just will, will, they will pray by the inch, and yet they, they, they will socialize by the mind. You can't get them to talk five minutes by the altar of prayer, and yet you have a party, and they'll stay half the night there at that party and have a big time because that's where they're interested. Now, some churches cater to that carnal thing and to that immature type of Christianity, but I believe, brother and sister, that we ought not to cater to that thing, but instead we ought to cater to the Spirit of Jesus Christ. There are enough churches in our community that cater to socializing that we don't need to join the ranks with. Amen? And this is, this is important. It's more important than sometimes I think that we find the, a real balance uh, in uh, our kind of worship that we have, the kind of services and church that we're going to have. I would say the average church is just a big fellowship hall. The average church has degenerated today into that sort of thing, consisting of a music room, a party room, a gymnasium, just something that feeds the place.
flesh. It is no longer a true church of Jesus Christ, but rather a society. And many full gospel churches are bought into this same snare of the devil. Many of them have been tripped up into the same pitfalls, and they have gone into just a Christian fellowship rather than the, the Christian church. Now, I recognize that there is a place uh, for fellowship and, and fun and even bodily exercises. But I tell you, friends, it's got to be kept in its place. And, and I, I realize that if I had some people run this church, we would have more parties and more sports and more socials than we would church. That's why it's got to be kept in the leadership of what kind of parties and socials and sports we're going to have if we're going to have a church of Jesus Christ. Some people in, 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 the, in the church will bring snow, cold, ice, storm, and anything to attend a party or a sports event where they can get together and eat hot dogs and play games and kick the ball around, and yet they will not come to a prayer meeting or a Tuesday night visitation under any circumstance. Do you know why? Because they are carnal and immature Christians. Amen. Say amen or all me. Amen. 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 You might as well say it now. You know it's true because they're carnal. Now we can expect little children uh, to have little birthday parties Saturday afternoon and, and gather together and pull up food and sit around eating cake and ice cream and, and play little games, ring around the roads. We can, we can expect the little children to do that. We wouldn't deny them of that privilege. Uh, it, it, not for a minute we wouldn't do that. No, we wouldn't do that. But the Bible tells us when I was a child, I think a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Yeah. And I think there's some grown-ups, some near grown-ups, they're still playing a part of the child. And they haven't really grown up in the things of God. And uh, it's easy for a church even to, to uh, cater to that kind of thing. The carnal nature. I think that uh, the nature of some people kind of people that are always clamoring after more parties, more socials, more sports events, more entertainment type services, more of the spectacular type of services, this kind of thing. Those kind of people who are always clamoring for those kind of things are the same people who do not care a thing about a prayer meeting. They don't care a thing about a carrying service. They don't care a thing about the service we had last Thursday night. They don't care anything about seeking for the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit or going out and winning souls for Christ or teaching a, a teaching position in the sun. Do anything that's spiritual. They're not concerned about because their carnality sticks up all over. Those kind of people that always want parties and socials and sports and they're so thrilled with those kind of things and want to bring that into the church are the same kind of people that love to sit in front of the TV set by the hour. They're the same ones that sneak around when no one's looking and read the kind of literature that they ought not to be reading. It's carnality all the way through. I've, I've seen it. It, it, all, it all goes hand in hand together. A social church, a church that caters to the social part of man, to the carnal part of man, to the fleshly part of man, that kind of a church is producing an immature type of Christianity. One that is catering to carnality rather than spirituality, spirituality will eventually produce trouble, corruption, corrosion, destruction, and a last stagnation and degeneration. You can see it right down the line. And this thing is of something that's just theory with me. This has been proven over and over and over again. Just take a look at the churches around about us. And as soon as they went into the social type of gospel, this same thing started to happen in their churches until at last they degenerated into nothing. And over these past years, when practically every church round about us has been fallen apart, our church has had a steady increase and in growth and going forward in the spirit and into miracle numbers and numbers. Because we've tried to cater to the spiritual life, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and not to the soul. Great denominations have risen and fallen, and their fall can be contributed to the day when they took up their prayer benches and they brought in their dinner tables in their churches. And all they have left today is a social thing. And brother, when you just want social, the world can make you even better social than the church can anything. Right. God didn't call that. I say let the 
the church be the church. Let us, let us keep our goal and focus. Why are we here? What is the purpose of our being? And let's strive towards that. Let the church be the church. God did not call us to organize social groups. God did not call us to sponsor sporting events and sporting teams and rubbing sales and spaghetti supper. God's called us to pray and to seek His face and to spread the gospel and produce Christian maturity. Let's keep, let's keep on the main mind, brother and sister. Let's not get off on some balance. Now certainly we want our young people to meet and to marry one another in the church. We want that. I think that, that should be a desirable thing and a goal. And, and I think most of you that, that know my wife and I very well, you can you have to confess that probably my wife and I have been instrumental in matching more couples than any of you ever have. <laughs> We've been pretty good cupids at times. You know, shooting the arrow. And I believe there's a place for that. And uh, any of you fellows who graduate from high school and you got yourself a good job and you finish your education and you've come to maturity enough that you can handle a, a wife and you want a wife. If you're having trouble finding one, you come and see me. I'll pray with you. <laughs> we'll, we'll help you out. That's right. <laughs> and I don't think it's bad to do it either. It's all right. There's a time for it. But, but, let me, let me put this little PS on. But there are some that are encouraging teenagers in the courtships that only leads to premature sex developments that are harmful to their bodies, to their minds, and to their souls. And we better be careful about it. Now when they start passing a certain age that we are more concerned about, but when these early teenagers, it's not the time to be encouraging going to Some of you mothers are the most guilty of all. <laughs> Men said, Amen. <laughs> Teenagers should not be going steady. Amen. Teenagers should not be keeping late hours. Amen. Teenagers should not be playing matching games and kissing games.
exercise, I think some people would feel a lot better physically if they'd be out and get some more fresh air once in a while. Get some exercise. They need that. We all need that. Bible says bodily exercise profits a little. So there is some profit in it. We need that. But there's also a tremendous danger along these lines, too, because it's easy to get out of balance if we're not careful. If, if you let the carnality part of man rule us, it'll go out of balance on the other side, and because there are some people, all they think of is sports. They eat, they drink, they sleep sports. Morning, noon, and night, they live for some kind of sport. And their very God is their sport. Amen? We have many who bow down to the football as their God. Holy, holy are thou, almighty football. It comes first, second, and last in their life. Or the baseball, or or a, or a gun, or a fishing rod, or anything else. Our balance, it can be wrong, and it can be, it can be sinful. There's a lot of people who have lost their souls because of sports. There's a lot of churches that have gone into degeneration, and it God is written over them because of their overemphasis on organized sports. Amen? Amen. So what is our position in regard to I think that we are opposed to organized sports in the church. Let the church be the church, not a place to organize teams for playing games. The atmosphere of most sports is, uh, is, is not good. It's inconsistent with Christianity. The very atmosphere of the, in many of these sports activities and, and games and so on, there, there are tires of consistency in many of them with Christian principles the bodily injuries, injuries that are incurred are inconsistent with the teachings of Christ. I know of men who would not smoke a cigarette for the world because they know that tobacco and nicotine injures their body. They know their body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. They will not, they wouldn't think of taking a cigarette into their, into their mouth and smoking because they know it would defile their temple and against the principles of God. And yet they will bust themselves against someone and break their arm and break their neck and bruise them for life. They won't hurt their body. Oh, what's the devil? The Holy Ghost. I must hurt my body. It's sin and death, and I have to kill another guy playing football. Now, I got you, don't I? What are you going to say now? Let's be consistent about the thing. If you're going to break somebody up, break yourself up. Don't break any guy. <laughs> and a lot of these injuries are not accidents. My own face. It just aren't. It, 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 it's inconsistent with Christian principles to be hurting somebody, beating on them, doing things that interest to them, I think. And then I think of the tremendous revival of the Lord's Day because of organized sports. This is probably the one of the worst things. It's a crime. The way these football teams and so on have, have defiled the Lord's Day. You can hardly be a star, hardly be in organized sports anymore, professional sports, without playing on a Sunday. Isn't that true? And Sunday is the Lord's Day, a special day for rest and worship. That's what it's for. Not a day to be beating your head against somebody else who's off a football field. Or dissipating all your energies and have nothing left for God and for worship of Lord. Now, many of you organize or encourage the organization of any sports teams in our church, or you start to organize a Sunday afternoon football game in the spring, I pray that God will judge you so severely that you will realize your sin one way or the other. Now, I put up with these things just about as long as we want. When springtime comes, the summertime is gone, comes our young men are out beating themselves around on a football field. On Sunday afternoon, they come dragging into the house of God without enough hardly energy to pray down an ounce of power. And I don't think it's right. <laughs> You're still there? You say, all right, brother, sir. I don't agree with you. Okay, you don't. Some of you are going to be prone to oppose what I say this morning. But I know what I'm speaking about. And I'm telling you that God's going to vindicate what I speak. You can oppose. But it's going to be to your own heart and your own detriment. I'm not speaking for myself this morning. But I'm speaking for God. For our church, therefore, I don't have to fight for myself. You 
because God's going to fight the battle for me. I've seen it happen before and it'll happen again. I want to be more severe this time because I'm publicly telling you what God wants of our church and what he doesn't want. Thank you all. 